the second talk of this morning, which is going to be by Sherson Ferreira from Universidade Federal de Berlândia, Uberlândia, and he's going to talk about interplay between boundary conditions and Wilson's mass in direct like Hamiltonians. Okay, um, so thank you for the introduction and thank the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you guys here. Um, so first I want to introduce myself before starting to talk about the work. Uh, I was a uh, Carlos student during the uh, undergrad studies and the PhD. Now I'm a professor at Uberlandia. And um, just for the Brazilians, uh, maybe you all know already, but I, I developed this extension for Chrome Firefox and Safari to bypass the CAPS per Tauge Periodicus. And um, it, it, I, ha I have this extension for a few years already, but not everybody knows about it, so I like to advertise. I have over 15,000 users so far, many people use, but uh, every time I, 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 I go give a talk, there's always somebody who still don't know about it. So for PRL, PRB, you don't need it anymore. Now we can uh, access PRL directly. But for science, uh, nature, and some others, you still have to go through the, the portal de periodicus. And the extension basically automatizes this process. So it's, it's not illegal, it's just a, a workaround to avoid having to go through the trouble. So please go to my web page and download if you are interested. Um, okay, so Uberlandia, so it's not so, uh, so well city uh, in Brazil, just to locate our, our ourselves. It's uh, around here, a little bit above the Sao Paulo state. It's uh, around 800 kilometers from, the, from Sao Paulo uh, city. It's a nice city. Uh, this is a picture. My apartment is somewhere around here. Uh, it's a nice place to live, a very clean, very safe city. And a big city has around 800,000 inhabitants. Uh, it's reasonably large. The campus is quite beautiful during summer and during winter. If you go there right now, it's, it's the dry season, so everything is, is uh, gray. But uh, uh, during, during the summer, it's quite beautiful. And the summer lasts for seven months. So, <laughs> so it's pretty much always like this. Um, we are famous for, um, for many things. I think I, I forgot to put here, but if you go to Berlandia, we don't have... Uh, we are not near the sea, uh, but we have great food, great cheese, great beer, great uh, cachaça, and um, there's many rivers that we can do actually aqua sports as well. So it's a nice place to be. Um, this is my group at Uberlandia, George, Vernac, Fabricio, Bozelli, me and my wife, Mariana. Uh, we work with spin-related phenomena, topological insulator, Mariana Fermions time-dependent and non-equilibrium transport, and strong correlated systems. My expertise is here more on the top, uh, it's being related phenomena and topological insulators. But recently I've been starting to work with the Caldish formalism for spin diffusion as well. And this is a picture of the groups, an old picture, but um, many people are still here, I still there. Henan is my student, Bruno was my student. Um, well from my students, only these two so far. And um, to acknowledge my collaborators already at the beginning, so I don't forget later, I also work with the Electronic Structure DFT group at UFU, which is mainly Tomé and Iroki. Um, and my students, uh, the ones involved in this work, I'm going to talk basically about two works. Uh, the initial work was developed by Felipe and Bruno. It was Bruno's uh, uh, master thesis, master uh, dissertation. Um, but then Bruno left the group, now he's working at the Computer and Mathematics Science Department at USP in São Carlos. Uh, and Felipe is busy with a lot of works, so to continue the work I had to assemble a new team. Then I got uh, Augusto to work with the DFT and group theory aspects, uh, Renan to help a little bit because the work was quite dense. Uh, but the main job was done by Ramon, who wa uh, so the, 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 tech the, the topic is also part of his master uh, dissertation. But Ramon left the group to teach at high school, so we had to finish the paper without him. So in the end, he became the third author because he couldn't have time to write the paper, but most of the work was actually done from by him. And interestingly, after the paper was on archive, uh, the one I'm going to talk about today, I got an email from Daniel Vargas from Delft, interested in the work, and we were discussing through uh, emails, and he made a huge contribution, and he became a co-author as well after the paper was already on archive. Uh, so the next version, there will be Daniel Vargas names there, there as well. So I'm going to talk about these two works. Um, it's a mixture of both. So the first one, developed by Bruno and Filippi, 
uh, is confinement in the fermion doubling problem in Dirichlet -like Hamiltonians, which is a methodology to avoid a problem that you don't know about, but I'll tell you what the problem is. And the second work that we just got accepted for PRB is the title of this talk, Interplay Between Boundary Conditions and Wilson Masses in Dirichlet -like Hamiltonians. So it's a, it's a continuation of this work, but as I said, with new authors because the team changed and I had to adapt the team a little bit. Um, the idea here is that if you want to solve the Dirichlet equation, um, boundary conditions are important, and depending on how you apply boundary conditions, you can have different types of quantized states. This is similar to a uh, picture from Carlos for of the quantum dots confined. So in this case, I apply a type of boundary conditions that doesn't break time reversal symmetry. And in this case, uh, the boundary condition breaks time reversal symmetry. And although boundary conditions seem trivial, when you are talking about boundary conditions on the Dirac Hamiltonian, it is not so trivial. It's an old problem that occurs already in high energy physics on how to simulate uh, um, um, Dirac particles on a lattice, if you want to do numerical models. So um, I like to put this picture here. I, I don't want to compare myself to Steve Jobs, especially because I don't like him so much. But um, I like this sentence here. Apple would solve problems customers didn't know they had. And I feel that that's basically what I'm going to do through this uh, talk. I'm going to talk about something that you didn't even know it was a problem. And I'm going to give you a solution, just like Steve Jobs would do. So uh, my outline is pretty much an introduction to the Dirac models, which we all know about, so I'll go quickly. Um, I'm going to introduce the two problems, which is the fermion doubling problem and the confinement, how to apply boundary conditions to this equation. And the solution is a simple solution, the Wilson mass. And then I can apply, which, which the Wilson mass is a parabolic correction to the Dirac Hamiltonian. So I'm going to compare the, the linear K and the K square models. And I'm going to apply for graphene nanoribbons and topological insulators. I'm going to focus more on graphene nanoribbons because it's a well-known system. And uh, we can s truly uh, understand the physics happening there. While in topological insulators, I would have to go through much more details and I won't have time. So I'm just going to quickly show the result for topological insulators and the conclusions. Um, OK, so Dirichlet like Hamiltonians. I must say, I have no idea who made this picture. So every time I present this, if you are in the audience, please let me know. I found it on Google. It's very beautiful. But there is no source for the picture. So uh, if you are listening to the talk, I'm sorry. Uh, so the Dirichlet -like Hamiltonian occurs already in graphene, as we all know. Near the k-point, you have the Dirichlet cone. Um, but as you confine the Dirichlet cone, you can have either the armchair nanoribbon or the zigzag nanoribbon for the two basic uh, confinements. Of course, you can have many others, but the main ones are these ones. Um, and the band structure changes drastically, of course, from one to the other. The armchair nanoribbon Basically, what you get is a quantization of the Dirac cone into subbands, while for the zigzag, what you get is the flat band connecting k and k prime states. Everybody knows how to calculate these two, but there are some subtleties that need to be um, acknowledged. Um, for topological insulators, well, Carlos made an introduction about the topic already, so I, I can skip. This is the first experiment from Mollenkamp's group showing the quantization of the conductance. And on topological insulators, what you have are edge or surface states that are helical and uh, has uh, uh, an effective Hamiltonian that is of the Dirac-like uh, Hamiltonian sigma dot k plus some other corrections. Um, the main idea here is the inversion of the gap, but uh, I will not talk about deeply on topological insulators, so let's skip this part. It has many different applications. I like very much this paper from Dolcini, which is not well known, but. Uh, uh, this type of construction to create uh, devices is very interesting as well. Um, so what is the fermion doubling problem? Uh, I, I put a cartoon here that I like a lot. So I think everybody will uh, uh, recognize themselves there. So if you are a theoretician, if you, you look at the nature, nature is very simple. Sigma dot k, how hard can it be? It's like the simplest Hamiltonian uh, besides the p squared over m. Uh, but it's the simplest possible Hamiltonian. And then you try to simulate that and it breaks. It doesn't work. And you don't know it, it doesn't work. But let's see what happens there. So this is an old problem already from quarks and gluons on a discrete lattice. How can you simulate that on a discrete lattice? Um, so OK, so what is this problem? 
So let's go through the simplest possible example, which is uh, a 1D Dirac model, sigma x, kx. And let's discretize this model. So I have, I'm going to take my x coordinate and discretize into uh, a set of points with a spacing A, which takes my k operator, I replace with the derivative, and I apply the symmetric derivative to conserve uh, hermeticity of the problem, to preserve hermeticity of the problem. But the problem here is that uh, this type of discretization of the lattice skips the central point. I have here psi on the next point minus psi on the previous point, but it never has the psi on n, on the central point. And this is the source of the fermion doubling problem. It occurs only if you have this linear, this, uh, the, this linear derivative, this k-linear uh, model. To see what actually occurs, Let's go to the second quantization, and then we can apply a Fourier transform and simplify or change this Hamiltonian into the creation, uh, into nomenclature of creation operators on K space. And what you get is this. So the linear Hamiltonian becomes a, a sine function. For small k, it's linear. Everything is OK. You get the correct result. But for large k, you see here, for small k, everything is OK. But for a large k, the sign goes down, and at k a equals pi, it goes to zero again. So the spectrum you were interested in is the linear spectrum, the blue one, and you have here true fermions, the true solutions. But if you discretize the lattice, you get the red one, and then you have here the doublers. These are spurious states that shouldn't exist and only exist because you discretize the lattice. So this is the fermion doubling problem. Um, this is terrible if you want to do transport calculation because these states will interfere with the true states. So you have to eliminate them if you want to do transport or diffusion, whatever kind of calculation with your model. Um, so how can you solve this? There are many ways to solve. The Wilson mass is the one I'm going to talk about, but there is also staggered fermions, non-local discretizations, all these coming from high-energy physics. Um, the staggered fermions was used, for instance, by Kai Levenkov uh, from Fluminense, uh, and it's a terrible way to solve the problem. It's a very complex, so you have to take the lattice, the square lattice, and you, you, you sh create a second auxiliary lattice to avoid this problem. It's a terrible thing because it's difficult to implement, it's complicated, it takes a while. Uh, while the, the Wilson mass is a very easy way to solve the problem, so if there is an easy way to solve the problem, I could stop my talk here, but there are some issues there. Um, so the idea is take your linear Hamiltonian and add a quadratic term with a mass M, Wilson mass, some matrix, matrix sigma W, could be sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z, in this 2D case, 2, 2 by 2 case, and then the K square correction. You do the same, apply the Fourier transform, and now the Fourier transform of the K square term gives you 1 minus cosine of Ka. And this kind of solves the problem because if you diagonalize this guy now, at k a equals pi, the sine goes to zero, which gives you the doubler here. But if you add this term, cosine of k a equals pi gives you um, minus one, with this minus becomes two. So at k a equal pi, you get a contribution from this guy, which opens the gap as in this black curve, and you recover something that gives you only the true fermions. And if this term, if you choose the value of the mass properly, basically at low energies, your spectrum remains linear as it should be. And only at high energies, you get something different. But we are doing solid state physics, so we only care about what's happening at low energies anyway. So, everyth so everything is fine there. This is a very well, no well known problem. Um, but it, the, the, the issue is, if you add this term, you might break a symmetry. What are the parabolic terms? What are the k square corrections that are allowed by symmetry? Is there any uh, that is actually allowed by symmetry and solve this problem? So in high energy physics, this is, this is incorrect. There is no way to add a parabolic term in high energy physics that doesn't break a symmetry. So this is well known as the no-go theorem from Nielsen Ninomia uh, from 81. So while the Wilson mass solves this problem in high energy physics, it breaks a symmetry, and then you can get incorrect solutions as well. But we are not doing high energy physics, we are doing solid state, and it turns out that we can add this term there, but you have to, be, you have to do it carefully. 
have to respect the symmetries. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I don't have the time running, so I have no idea. Uh, I'll, I'll try to follow from here. <laughs> uh. So just so people can appreciate, so by adding b you know, this term, you get the black curves, right? Yes. But, you know, but they're still going to be restricted to this, this you know, small k yes. regime. So then I could also stay in the small k regime for the red curve. And then I would not. That depends. No, no, you can't. That, that's what I wanted to explain today. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no, you can't. Uh, if you if you want to do transport calculations with green functions, you're going to calculate the inverse of your Hamiltonian, and then everything will 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 provide a, a contribution to the current. Uh, basically, when you calculate the current, you fix the energy and you sum over all k space. So you're going to get both solutions, the correct ones and the bad ones. If you want to do just a fitting, if you want to fit your band structure, then you just uh, <laughs> don't show those solutions. Just uh, put the picture in the between, and then everything seems okay, right? But if you want to do something else, this will this will get in you, you get in trouble because you have to sum over k space. So this will contribute because they occur at the same energy, right? If you, if you wanted to do transport, you fix the energy and you and you you start with uh, uh, ansatz that your wave function is the sum of all states with a given energy. So they will contribute. There is no way to automatize. To um, a way to eliminate this, especially if you're doing green function. No, because if you if your energy is down here, uh, no, but over there, no. But down here, this is this is actually exaggerated. Um, if you if you increase the mass, this will go up and gets more linear here. So there's a there's a correct way to choose the value of the mass to avoid this issue, and it works great. Uh, I'll show you. Um, the second problem is the confinement of Dirac particles. This is also an old problem. It was initially uh, discussed by Barry and Mondragon in '87. And uh, basically, what happens is if you try to confine Dirac particles, saying that the wave function should go to zero at the borders, is pretty much the same as this picture, trying to confine people from passing through this gateway. So, I, so the correct bounded condition is cannot be just wave function going to zero at the borders. I'm going to show you why. So let's say the question is, can I do this with Dirac Hamiltonians? If not, what is the correct boundary condition? Um, so again, let's let's forget about discretization. Now I'm going to go through the continue exact model, no lattice, just uh, analytical solutions. So I have the Dirac spectrum, the perfect Dirac spectrum, and uh, I want to fix the energy here, and then I'm going to make a combination of the wave function using the solutions from this point and this point to combine and apply boundary conditions. And I want you to do it with vanishing wave function. So the general solution is a linear combination of these two points like this. And if I try to apply psi of some point 0 equals 0, um, basically what you get is this. C1 plus C2 must be 0, and C1 minus C2 must be 0. The only way to solve this equation is if C1 and C2 is 0, which means that the wave function is no everywhere. So if you try to apply this boundary condition, you fail drastically. You get a, a, a new solution. There is no solution with this boundary condition. And why is that? What is the meaning of saying that psi should go to zero at the edge? Or what is trapping the particle that you want to trap? So the problem here is Klein tunneling. If you typically, when you think about boundary conditions, you apply electrostatic potential at the borders, which confine the electrons. But if you do that with uh, uh, Dirac particles, you don't confine. You have uh, states available everywhere, so you get Klein tunneling. Um, what you need is a gap. Instead of just applying some electrostatic potential there, you need to open a gap on the outer region, and then you have evanescent states, and you get through confinement. So how can you do that? You need some massive term there. You need the Wilson mass term there to break to, to do this. Um, Okay, so the modeling, I, I will not go through the derivations, but um, what you could do to, to solve, to open a gap is add, this is not the Wilson mass, it's a confinement mass, but I'll show you they are the same. Um, so it's a potential profile where H is zero inside your sample and H is one out of the sample. And this sigma C matrix is some Pauli matrices matrix that actually opens a gap in the Dirac spectrum. And uh, if you take M to infinity, then, you, ha then you, you get the hard wall boundary conditions. 
uh, this process of applying this, uh, of using this term to introduce the confinement is equivalent to the work of Barry, ba Barry Mondragon for, for neutrinos. Uh, McCann and Falco applied this for carbon nanotubes. Akimerov and Benacker for graphene monolayers. And me and Daniel Laws for topological insulators. And now again, me and my students and Daniel Vargas, uh, we are putting this in a solid ground. So in all these works, ev everything is okay, but here we are doing something extra. We are connecting these two problems. We are connecting the confinement problem with the fermion doubling problem to show you that they are actually just one problem that occurs uh, in different instances. Um, so I'm going to introduce here a notation. So the matrix, the unitary matrix that multiplies kx, I'm going to generically call uk, which is the matrix that defines the kinetic term, and the matrix that defines the confinement, I'm going to generically call uc, u confinement, which introduces the, 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 the broken symmetry that opens the gap there. Um, so let's see now, uh, let's instead of using the, the the boundary condition that the wave function goes to zero at the edge, I'm going to replace that with this boundary condition, which is the one developed in these works. So y this is a matrix, it's a singular matrix, so if you combine UK and UC the, uh, on this form, this gives you a singular matrix, which means that there is a non-trivial solution for Psi. So the, the, the wave function at the edges doesn't go to zero, but the spinner components, they combine in a way that this uh, equation uh, is fulfilled. So let's try to apply the boundary conditions like this now. So again, the simple model, 1D model. Um, and now instead of saying the wave function goes to zero, I'm going to consider the confinement matrix to be sigma z. The general solution is the same, but now I apply this boundary condition like this. If you open these matrices and you truly go through the calculation, you will find that uh, cosine of kl must be zero, which gives you the discrete values for k which is very simple. And now, let's do the same thing again, but instead of using uc equals uz, let's use uh, sigma y, because you have two choices here. Um, if you do this again, the same uh, unsets, and you apply the boundary conditions, and you get again cosine of kl equals zero. Uh, it's very easy to show why they should be the same, but uh, I'll skip this. But while, so this means that the energies, the quantized energies in both cases will be the same. But since the boundary conditions combine the spinners in different ways here than here, the wave functions are actually different. So basically, if, you are, if I use the confinement, confinement matrix as sigma z or as sigma y, I'm breaking different symmetries of the system, uh, which turns out in this particular case to have the same energy spectrum, but the wave functions uh, are, are completely different in, in this case and in this case. Uh, the combinations here will become different. The C1 and C2 will be different. Um, okay. Um, okay, so let me summarize these problems and uh, introduce the solution. So I can either work with the linear Hamiltonian, some constant alpha, which will be the Fermi velocity, the kinetic matrix, unitary matrix, and K. But if I work with the linear Hamiltonian, I have to apply this weird boundary condition. A question there? Can you actually use a combination of the two boundary conditions? No. No? No, no. Uh, on the paper, I, I, I'm actually proving rigorously that you can only apply these or the other boundary conditions in different cases. So okay. I'm not going through the derivation here, but uh, this is the only allowed boundary condition. This is the type of boundary condition that is allowed. So, um, yeah, okay, so if you're working with the linear case, you have to apply this weird boundary condition, which works great if you're doing numeric, if you're doing an analytical job. If you're solving analytically, as I did before, it's, it's correct and it's fine. But if you're doing numerical, uh, discretizing the lattice, it, there's actually no way to apply this boundary condition on a numerical problem. It's not only difficult, it's impossible to apply this boundary condition numerically. So it's much better then to introduce the k-square correction, and I, I show in the paper that if you introduce this k-square correction as the Wilson mass, then you can apply the trivial boundary condition wave function vanishing at the edge. Um, so then uh, in the first paper, I made a conjecture um, that this is true, that these two problems are equivalent, 
only if the matrix UW that defines the Wilson mass is equal to the matrix UC that defines the confinement. You see, UC appears here, UW appears here. So these are two drastically different problems. There's something very interesting here because, as you can see here, depending on how I choose the boundary conditions through UC, I change the problem. I change the physics, I change the symmetries that I'm breaking, I change everything. But here, the wave for the quadratic term, for the quadratic model, the wave function should always vanish at the border. So where is the information about the boundary? There was information about the boundary at UC, but if it disappears here, where is the information about the boundary? And what we show now in this paper is that the, the information that was here goes through UW, and indeed, the only allowed choice is UW equals UC. So there's a connection between the quadratic term and the boundary condition for the Dirac models. This is the main result that we show here, and we prove this systematically, rigorously, for all cases. Um, with the help of, actually, the help of Daniel Vargas was to actually go a step further and prove it uh, more deeply, this connection. Um, okay, so why? Why are they the same? So this is basically symmetry constraints, which is group theory. Um, so the idea is, let's now put everything together. I have the kinetic term, the Wilson mass, and the confinement potential. Um, if I so direct, the, the, well, just what I just said. Um, so if I now consider a system that is defined by a space group G, which is given by some symmetries that I call a generically S plus and some symmetries that I will call generically S minus. The difference between them is that S plus keeps X invariant. There should be a plus and minus here, sorry. So X pl uh, S plus keeps X invariant and S minus changes the sign of X. That's it. Just two, two types of symmetries. Uh, and your Hamiltonian must be invariant under the group G if you apply this, if you apply the commutators of the symmetry elements with the Hamiltonian, you find constraints, and the constraints that we find are, are this. For the UK matrix, the UK matrix must commute with all S plus operations and must anti-commute with the S minus operations. This defines the UK, the which defines the Dirac model. Um, the UW and the UC matrices, they both must commute with S plus and S minus, and they must anti-commute with UK. So basically, what I mean here is that UC and UW must obey the same symmetry constraints. So if they obey the same symmetry constraints, they are equivalent in a sense that they are given by the same linear combination of possible unitary matrices. They are defined within the same linear space of matrices. Um, and this anti-commutation is not really a symmetry, but it's a condition of vanishing currents at the walls, which is introduced by Barry Mondragon in 87. So this establishes the problem. This, uh, I'm skipping the derivation, but uh, this establishes what the matrices can be. Um, and to see what happens, let's apply these ideas to graphene nanoribbons. Again, why graphene nanoribbons? Well, it's a well-known problem. We all know the solution. We all know what you expect. And then we will see something that we didn't expect. Um, this, I like to, to uh, this paper from Alexis uh, and Caio is a very good paper, but they use this um, stagger lattice uh, uh, model to solve this problem. And if you read the paper carefully, you see that it doesn't solve the problem completely. They still have to go and remove some doublers by hand. So um, um, it's a very difficult problem in practice to be solved. Uh, and through our methodology, it's gone. There's no more problem if you accept my, my proposal. Um, so graphene nanoribbons, I'm going to do for armchair nanoribbons and for zigzag nanoribbons. Um, so the idea here is I'm going to take the wave function and, and I'm going to expand the wave function using the usual envelope function formulation, uh, where this phi mi and phi mi prime are the solutions at k and k prime, so I consider both k and k prime. Uh, you have the phase here, uh, block phase, and then you have the envelope functions, which is the, I, I want to find the equation for the envelope functions, right? Um, here, k and k prime are the deviations of k from k and k prime. And just to allow to show you, uh, block this, this unsatisfies block theorem perfectly, okay? 
so I start with this, and then I go through the group theory methods to find the effective equation for the envelope functions f mu and f mu prime. Um, and I find this, 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 this Hamiltonian. I will not go through the details. I'm going to show you the results only. But I have to do this for armchair and for zigzag separately because they, they have different, different symmetry constraints. There's a, they're a little bit different from, from one another, as they should. Um, so particularly both, if you, if you consider the, the wave function expansion with both k and k prime, then I can show you that through this expansion, both zigzag and armchair transform as the D2H group, while typically uh, from uh, uh, Kansado's talk, uh, he said that if you are working at the k point, you should use the D3H group, which is true because you only have C3 rotations. But if you consider both k and k prime in your wave function expansion, then you extend this to the D2H group. Okay, it's a trick. Uh, it works and it's correct. Um, if you include k and k prime. So what I use here is the generators of D2H, which is the three mirrors, mirror x, mirror y, and mirror z, time reversal. And uh, this is not a true symmetry. You, you should not impose chiral symmetry. Chiral symmetry is something you find, not something you impose. But since the usual models of graphene are always chiral, the Dirac model is chiral, and I want to compare with the Dirac model, then, I then, then I'm, I'm applying chiral symmetry to, to be able to compare properly the results. Um, so using group theory and the method of invariance, um, for the linear term, we get the Dirac, the Dirac model as we should. Um, but to show you the true, the, f the, the full result, for zigzag, we get this. So uh, I have here the, the direct sum of the Dirac model for the k and for the k prime uh, um, values of graphene. And then here I have the Wilson mass. So I put this over two here for convenience. It doesn't really matter much. So I have the Wilson mass, the k square term, and you have the confinement matrix UC, which depends on this parameter eta. So the if, if you look at these terms carefully, you see that the UK matrix, which defines the kinetic energy, is sigma x, sigma x. And this one turns out to be uh, this combination of sigma y's. And eta is a free parameter that defines the boundary condition, but it's restricted to two values. It can either be 0 or it can be 1. And I'll show you the difference uh, soon. Um, for armchair, the results are similar. I get here a, a combination of the direct cone from k and k prime, it's a direct sum. And uh, for the Wilson mass, same shape, but here is ky and here is kx because it's different directions of confinement. Um, and the UC matrix for the armchair depends on a free parameter theta. Um, so the kinetic term here is sigma y minus sigma y, and the UC matrix here is this combination of trigonometrical functions. And Theta here is a continuum parameter. Here, eta, eta can only be plus or uh, 0 or 1, but here, theta is a continuous parameter between 0 and 2 pi. Uh, but these parameters, they define the boundary conditions for the zigzag and armchair nano ribbons. So let's start with the graphene nano ribbon. This is now a numerical simulation on a lattice. So we're going to start with uh, a, a lattice with a large uh, spacing A which is bad, and it will give you fermion doublers. It will give you the spurious states that are wrong. And then I'm going to reduce A and show you that these states disappear. So it starts like this. You have here the Dirac quantized Dirac bands for the k point and for the k prime point. But here in the middle, you have a bunch of states that shouldn't exist. There should be a, a straight line here connecting k and k prime points, which is the, 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 the flat band of graphene. Now, if I reduce A, what happens is basically these spurious states, they are hy hybridizing and go into large energy. There's a coupling between them that takes them to higher, higher energy. If I keep reducing A, eventually there is no doublers on my, on my low energy spectrum. They are always there at high energy. It's impossible to avoid. But uh, in the low energy, which is the, the region that matters, they are gone. Um, so... What is the difference between eta zero and eta one? For eta zero, this the eta zero is my my proposal. So if if you apply eta zero here, you you get a new boundary condition which was developed in my work, um, which is the this is the boundary condition that couples 
these spurious, sta spurious states from K and K prime and uh, drives them to high energies, just like in the last slide. This only happens for eta zero. This is a type of boundary condition. This is the novel one. If you do it with eta one, you actually reproduce the well-known brain fatigue boundary conditions for uh, uh, um, armchair and ribbons. So this is well known. Uh, but the problem is the brain fatigue boundary conditions, they don't couple the K and K prime valleys. So what you get is actually a Dirac cone here, and then you have the, this is misleading actually, this state, th this branch goes here and continues there and reaches the doubler. If you take the limit of your lattice spacing to be zero, or if you achieve the continuum model back again, these doublers, they go to infinity and disappear for the, from the, for the problem. So since brain fatigue boundary conditions are usually taken as a boundary condition for the continuum model, these doublers will never occur because they will be uh, uh, moved to infinity. But your flat band will also continue to infinity, which is also wrong, okay? Um, while here, if you choose the proper values, you see that I have a very clean band structure. And um, the issue here with the doublers is, for instance, if I take the, the wave functions, the density profiles, for a solution around this point, I get the correct edge state dispersions. But if I take the solutions around the doublers, you see that it oscillates quickly. And this quick oscillation is a signature of the fermion doubling problem, which is caused by the central point of the derivative being skipped. So yeah, so the main, main message here is the minute boundary condition actually solves the problem properly for numerical models. Yeah. I just want to understand the middle curve. It's misleading. I just I don't understand it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The red one is your result. That it, everything is my result. Yeah, yeah okay. of yeah. course you generate them. Yeah. I'm, I mean, what oh, is your result and what is Bray and Fertig? Yeah, sorry, yeah. So the, this, this one is the result from, for my boundary condition, which is correct. And if, if, you, if you take Bray and Fertig boundary correction, boundary condition, you're going to get this quantized cone plus this one. So think about this being connected all the way through there. Uh, so I, I put this, the colors like this, but now I regret. I'll change that. Uh, I'll try to change that before publishing. Um, so this and this, they are part of the same solution, OK? And so also this one and this one are part of the same solution. Basically, the K and K prime values are completely uncoupled. It's block diagonal. While in my boundary condition, it, it is not block diagonal, and they are coupled. And through this coupling, they vanish when uh, A gets small enough. OK? OK, so let's uh, move now to armchair graphene nanoribbons. And everybody, I think I heard somebody talking about this here, about the metallic armchair nanoribbon. And this is an interesting case because technically this metallic, uh, metallic case, I put it between quotes, because the gap is actually not zero. If you go through group theory, you check the character tables, you do the proper calculation, you see that that crossing is not allowed by symmetry for the metallic case. There should be a gap. And then you go and check the paper. So there's this paper from 2000C from uh, Louis' group. Um, and they compare tight binding with DFT. And it's quite interesting. If you, if you run DFT, which is, let's say, exact for, all for this purpose, um, depending on the size, this is, this is the gap as a function of the size of your sample. For instance, for uh, a sample with uh, 12 atoms across uh, the ribbon, you get a small gap here. For uh, uh, 13, there's still a gap there. For 14, you get the metallic case, so the gap uh, would vanish. So the, the, the metallic case occurs when the number of atoms is equal to 3p plus 2, the, so the, the pink curve. So if you check the DFT data, for the small samples, there's always a small gap. Okay, it's a small, but it's there. It's not allowed, it shouldn't be zero by symmetry. If you go through very large samples, it, it goes down, it vanishes, but all of them vanish for large samples, and it vanishes as 1 over L, 1 over, one over the, the, the sizes of the sample. If you go to the tight bind model, well, first of all, a bunch of zeros that shouldn't exist, and uh, the 3P and 3P plus 1 give you the same gap. 
So there's something wrong with tight binding. So in this paper, Louis proposes a way to solve this, which is uh, basically you change the hopping parameter on the last sites of your nano ribbon, which kind of fixes the problem, but I think it's the correct it, it, this is not the correct interpretation of what's happening there, but it, it works. Um, so basically, the tight binding or uh, actually th this gap equals zero also occurs with the continuum model if you use Bray and fatigue boundary conditions. Uh, while in the DFT, there's always a finite gap, okay? And this gap is not allowed by symmetry, so there's something wrong with the models. Um, DFT is correct. Except there's a gap. There should be a gap. There, sh there should be, that is. Oh, there should be a gap. There should be, yeah. Yeah, there should be. So th what's wrong is, is tight binding where the gap is zero, okay? Um, so let's see what happens in our model. So the idea here, as I said, that theta is an effective... Jason, uh, I understand your argument, but the point that he, Stephen Louis, makes in this paper is that um, so you have an edge and the charge density at the edge is different from the charge density inside, so it basically changes the, the uh, hopping or the on-site energy yeah. to yeah. account for this small change. Yeah, and this will definitely open a gap, so you break the symmetry by by hand, but it's 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 yeah. different. So the exactly, but the problem actually he argues that the the if you relax the structure on the FT, uh, the lattice parameter on the edges are slightly higher, larger than uh, on the center. So that's why he changes the hopping. But if you calculate, if you check how much the 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 lattice parameter changes, is actually irrelevant. Uh, my my student uh, Augusto run the, calcul the DFT calculation with a pristine graphene and with the relaxed one, and the gap doesn't change at all. So I don't, I don't think I truly believe in these arguments. Yeah. Okay. One more, one more there. Regarding the tight binding you are talking about, you consider just PZ orbitals. Yes. If you will include PX and PY, you will see the same. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so let's see what happens to the model now. Remember that theta is a free parameter. Um, if you go to the brain fatigue boundary condition again, you see that my boundary condition for the generic theta becomes equivalent to the brain fatigue boundary condition if theta is equal to number of atoms plus one to pi over three, which is actually the block phase that accumulates from one edge to the other. So it's very simple to show this, and this is, a, this is the result from brain fatigue. But the problem, as uh, Alexandre was, was saying, that once you, once you apply confinement, you break a symmetry and things relax. So the block phase, you don't have block theorem along the confinement. You only have block theorem along the periodic sites. Um, so what we do is we allow theta to relax to theta Bray fatigue plus some deviation from Bray fatigue, and we did we run the DFT calculations. Uh, so this is the logarithm log log plots of the gap as a function of the size of the sample from DFT, pretty linear curve. So the gap goes with s one over l, and then we fit uh, the value of this shift delta theta as a function of the Fermi velocity, because the Fermi velocity can also change with the size of the sample because of the confinement and finite size effects. So we, we managed to, to, to picture here a, a fitting parameter. And um, if you plot now, this is, this is a comparison between uh, DFT, which are the points, um, the quadratic model, which is the solid lines, and the tight binding, uh, no, sorry, not the tight binding, and the, the linear model, which are the dashed lines. The linear model are actually shifted down so we can see it. Basically, they all agree, but for, for the models to agree, I need to use an effective theta that depends on the Fermi velocity, but uh, it's around 20 degrees for uh, this, this, the, this um, region of the, uh, of the solutions. Um, so you see here, first of all, the 3p plus 1 and the 3p have different gaps as they should in DFT. Um, and now the 3p plus 2 has a gap and obeys perfectly the, the DFT structure. So allowing theta to deviate from Bray fatigue also solves the problem here in the model while Steve Lewis model solves the problem for tight binding, okay? 
so an effective theta fixes the gap issue for, and uh, this is quite interesting. For delta theta equals zero, if you put, uh, if you put the brain fatigue boundary condition for the three P plus two here, this matrix actually diverges. And this matrix is part of my Hamiltonian. So if I have something in my Hamiltonian that diverges, it's non-physical. So, and it, it is true, as I said, this gapless state that occurs if theta, delta theta is equal to zero is non-physical in the sense that uh, it's not allowed by symmetry. So this divergence is quite interesting because it actually shows you that uh, more deeply. Um, here's a comparison of uh, DFT, which is the, the gray bands, the linear model, the red ones, tight binding, and the quadratic model with the Wilson mass. They all more or less agree in some sense, but here they capture the gap properly, while in tight binding without Steve Lewis uh, 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 modification, the gap is zero. And here's a comparison of the envelope, the, the, gray, the gray curves are the density uh, profiles from DFT, which has the, the atomic oscillations, while the, the colored points here are the envelope functions uh, from the models, which doesn't capture properly all the with an envelope functions, so it doesn't capture the atomic oscillations, but shows you uh, a good agreement with the DFT data for the armchair, and also for a zigzag, you can see here a good agreement with the edge states from, from DFT. So the model is, it matches well everything uh, and solves the problem in a very easy, very simple way. Um, here's a picture for topological insulators. I think I have some time left. Um, so we are studying this monolayer of uh, PBSE, and um, while in graphene you have two main cuts, armchair and zigzag, we show that in this paper here, that for PBSE, there's actually five different ways of cutting the lattice. Here I'm only showing three, but on the paper you can see the other two. Um, and uh, depending on how you cut the lattice, once again, you have different UK matrices and you have different UC matrices, and you can control the boundary condition through these variable parameters. And as you change the boundary conditions, the band structure changes a lot. For the A and B lattices, you see here, the difference between A and B lattices is determination. So for the A lattice, the lattice uh, ends in uh, PB atoms, while for the B ribbon, it ends in uh, uh, selenium atoms. Uh, so this small difference makes the Dirac cone occurs at a lower energy or high energy, and this is adjusted by this uh, free parameter rho, which is similar to the theta parameter. Um, and if you have this C lattice, where once one end of the ribbon terminates with um, uh, PB atoms and the other end terminates with selenium atoms, then you have both two Dirac cones, one above and one down here. Essentially, uh, this Dirac cone is degenerate. There's actually two here, one on top of the other, and also two here. So basically what you get in ribbon C is one of the cones from here, and one of the cones from here goes there. So it splits. So boundary conditions are quite delicate, and you have to do it carefully. Um, here are my conclusions, but uh, I, I still have five minutes. If you allow me, I'll, I'll, I'll go to some extra slides. To go back to the point that Dennis raised, when you mentioned the tight binding here, no, the other one, no, yeah, no, I, I the get there. Okay. no, no, the one you just showed, that your calculation. Uh huh. So there, you don't see a gap either. Here, no, that is here. So oh, tight, tight, tight binding, no, no. Yeah, but then is this a fair tight binding or just some tight binding? No, it's the sim simplest tight binding. Yeah, then the it's not tight it's binding. Then, according to Dennis, it's not fair yeah, to yeah. trash tight binding. I'm not defending tight binding. Don't do tight binding, but it's just not a fair comparison. If you do it properly, including more orbitals, you would sure. probably get sure, the but proper the, the, result. The, yeah, this is a tight binding that once you take to the low energy range, you get the simple Dirac model. So I want to compare to the simplest case. Okay? Um, yeah. So if you, if you give me, I have uh, four minutes left, so before talking about the conclusions, let me, me show you an um, overview of other projects because maybe you might be interested in other stuff as well. Um, so uh, Poliana will talk um, uh, at the end of the week, I guess, about the work we did with Carlos, my student, uh, Henan, and, and, and Poliana, 
where we study the, the ZTPV GUN and the lambda zener tunneling on topological insulators. So we basically we apply an electric field on topological, a high electric field on topological insulators, and we study how uh, the, the electrons, the electrons couple, uh, how they tunnel from the from the edge states to bulk states, and vice versa. Uh, this is interesting because allows us to discuss how a bulk state, uh, if a bulk state can actually uh, go to the edge and become an edge state, if there is a coupling between them, or if the edge states of the bulk states, if they will actually just bounce on the edges. Um, it's an interesting topic, but I'll let Poliana talk about this later. Um, I have an ongoing large collaboration with Iraqi professor, sorry, this should be Miwa, I think this is out correct, it's Iraqi Miwa, um, from UFU, Filippi, Filippi is a Iraqi um, uh, student, but I, I'm the co-advisor. So we have a series of papers on meta-organic frameworks where we study these carbon allotropes that allows you to, to manipulate the magnetism and manipulate the band structure quite nicely. We see topological edge states everywhere. In this particular paper, which is the third one here, um, we propose a system which is a layered uh, set of topological insulators of this type. And uh, by doing like this, if you apply an electric field across the sample, you can tune if the edge states will be located on the bottom, on the top, or spread uh, uh, all over the sample. So you can tune where the edge states are actually occurring along this uh, stacking of uh, monolayers. Um, a more recent work from uh, from this year, we are studying this uh, chiral borophin, which is a kind of a twisted lattice, which is chiral. So you have the, the the left version and the right version of the lattice, and if you combine them, so it's a bilayer, but the the lower layer is has one chirality and the top layer has a different chirality, and if you do this, uh, the band structure changes a lot, and what we see are helical p orbital texture so uh, this is completely spinless so this texture comes from orbital pseudo spin orbital interactions there's no spin here at all um, and this is quite interesting reading the papers we find out that this kind of texture actually enhances the spin torque on magnetic memories so it has a direct application it's it's quite interesting and occurs in this chiral borofin uh, b layer which is uh, very exciting um, recently we just got accepted this pccp paper on these Archimedean lattices, which is also very interesting. As you can see here, we have triangular lattice, square lattice, and graphene, and you have here Kagome lattice. But you can also have all these other type of lattices, which are 2D lattices of this type of lattice called Archimedean lattices. Uh, it's a, a nice way of, s of uh, 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 connecting this, this, uh, this, um, these shapes here. Uh, there's one that is non-symorphic also. And depend uh, there's uh, 11 of these lattices, and what we find is in many of them you have direct cones, in others you have flat bands that could lead to superconductivity. Um, you have high degeneracy K points, so uh, K points, which are the pseudo spin 1 and pseudo spin 2, which are useful for, for uh, uh, quantum computation. Um, you have topological phase transition, edge states, and everything. So there's a large variety of different types of bands that occur depending on the type of lattice you can you use. And there's there are chemical routes to construct all these type of lattices uh, using carbon allotropes. So these these are all feasible and quite exciting. And you can also you can also add metallic atoms here to make a metal organic framework that allows you to manipulate magnetization on these lattices. Um, recently, I've been working also with spin drift and diffusion uh, with my students uh, Ismael mostly. Uh, so we are doing Monte Carlo calculation and using the Keldish formalism for the spin drift diffusion with uh, two subbands. And we have some new results, but uh, still on preparation. But basically we can tune, Carlos, between the skewing lattice and a Bessel parameter by... These are both on the PSH, on the crossed PSH regime. But there are other parameters that allow us to switch between these two. So it's an ongoing work. It's quite interesting. We are calculating the relaxation time and everything. Um, I'll skip this one. Um, this is another interesting one, so uh, just to finish. Uh, these are uh, finite side effects on topological insulators. So is that in, in this case, there's a lot of group theory happening here. So basically, I have uh, a, a topological insulator built with, uh, I think this is selenium tellurite. Yeah. So, 
uh, basically the lattice of selenium tellurite, the symmetry changes a lot if you have an odd number of uh, atoms from bottom to top, or if you have an even number from bottom to top. And what changes is that for an odd number, the lattice is symorphic, so there's a mirror symmetry that connects this point to this one, but if the lattice has an uh, even number of points, you have a non-symorphic symmetry, so you have to mirror down here and then shift a fractional translation to here. And the band structure from the edge states changes a lot. From so from for the non for the symorphic case, uh, you have this double Dedekind band structure with these gaps open. These are hybridization gaps that occurs as you make the sample smaller, and you open all these four crossings. While for the non-symorphic, these central crossings are preserved by symmetry. And what happens is that in one case you have two phase transitions, while in the other there is no phase transition, which is protected by the non-symorphic uh, symmetry. And this allows you to manipulate uh, the edge states nicely as well. Um, with that, I'll, I'll finish the talk, just go back to my conclusions. So the main message here is that boundary conditions are delicate, you have to be careful, and there's a simple way to apply that if you want to do numerical models. Um, and also, through the work, through this development, we managed to develop a recipe for you to derive the boundary condition you want. So depending on how you want to confine the system, what is the boundary condition you should use? So by using group theory properly, you can derive the correct boundary condition. That's the main message. Thank you. So we have time for two more questions. No? So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.